delighted to be here. Um, I've had a long relationship with Esri going back to uh, 1980, 1999, which was really part of the reason that Open Ocean Global was founded. I'll tell you a little bit about us. But in 1999, I was the public and media affairs director for the city of San Diego, and there were 30 projects underway downtown and 100 more in the pipeline, and I knew that if I didn't do something, those problems were all going to land on my desk. So I put together 125 people that were doing construction and special events in downtown San Diego, and I said, if you tell us where your public impacts are, your closed streets, your lane closures, we'll map it and we'll help you figure out how to stay on time and on budget. And it worked like a miracle. In the six years I chaired that program, and we used ARC, we ARC, used ARC, um, ARC Map and ARC IMS to, to, to map all the streets and show where the, where the impacts would possibly be. There was not one day that we had a bad media story about all that construction. Um, and the reason it worked, though, is why I'm here today. It's because what we learned is that in sharing that information and putting it in a common format, everybody in the same box, if you will, we created a community. And that community knew how to communicate with each other, how to solve the problems themselves. All we had to do is say, hey, did you talk to Tom? And John talks to Tom, and, and all of a sudden, whatever conflicts there were, they disappeared. So I created Open Oceans Global in 2007 to see if we could test the ability to use mapping, GIS, as a way to create communities to solve ocean problems. And we've been around for 12 years now, and we've tested a lot of things and tried to figure out what might work. And what we think will work is what you're gonna hear about today, that we need to solve a problem, just like I solved the problem in downtown San Diego, by looking at one of the key ocean crises that, that are facing us. We've got a very small board to try to help us get on our relaunch. We've got a great uh, Gus board of advisors, including the former head of NOAA, former head of Scripps, former head of Cal EPA, director of communications for the Academy of Sciences, and president of the Aquarium of the Pacific, Viz Center director at San Diego State to help guide us on the way. But I wanna go back a little even farther. I wanna tell you a whale of a story, some history. In 1990, I was the executive director of the San Diego Oceans Foundation. And we published a comic book that went to every kid in San Diego County. We used Shamu as a spokes whale. I know that's not politically correct today, but that was a different time. And I'm showing you this because I wanna hear what you were, we were telling the public, what we told those kids. We told them about a pelican tangled with a six pack ring. And they got a picture of the pelican there. We have somebody saying, yes, plastics like six packs rings, monofilament, fishing line, and plastic bags have to be disposed of properly. We have to keep them out of the ocean. These are the messages, and we didn't make these messages up. These messages were already in circulation in 1990, and we just repeated them in a way that would get to more people. Let's move ahead to World Ocean Day 2019. ABC News, the problem with plastics is relatively new but serious. Use, reuse, discard, say no to plastic bags and plastic straws, reduce single-use plastic. In some ways, nothing's changed in 30 years, but in some ways, something has. Eight million tons of plastic continue to go into the ocean every year. Recycle, reuse isn't the problem. The problem is someplace else. And it's not about eliminating plastic straws. And this turtle that has become internationally famous is no different than our pelican was in 1990 and the sea lions and the other critters that we had pictures of at that point in time. And the solution isn't about beach cleanups. We need to keep getting rid of single-use plastics. We need to keep cleaning up our beach. But the sad thing is, cleaning up our beach has become a new norm. It's a social thing. We take our kids, that's how we teach them about the environment. It's not normal. And it's not about vacuuming the deep ocean, although I hope the clean ocean cleanup group is successful to whatever degree they can be in doing it. It's about stopping trash at the source. And the easiest way to look at that is to see the plastic supply chain to the ocean. We make oil, make plastic products, go one of three places. They go to litter, they go to landfills, or they go to be recycled. They go to litter, sometimes maybe they get picked up and go back to the landfill, but sometimes from the landfill they go back to being litter. And what happens when they're litter? What happens when it's uncontained? It goes in a river, it goes into the ocean. If it goes into the ocean, or the river can send more to the ocean, it's either in the ocean in some format or another, the gyres most famously, microplastics now, or it goes onto a beach. Sometimes the stuff from the gyre ends up on a beach. We clean up the beach and we send it back to the landfill. 
where it hopefully gets recycled, and then we have more plastic products. So what we've been focusing on is the green boxes, recycling, eliminating single-use plastics, beach cleanups. What we need to be focusing on, in addition, is effective trash management. Because in my mind, there's only two kinds of trash. Contained trash, trash that we manage, and uncontained trash that's going wild in the world. And the solutions to date, I think, have been stopgap. They make us feel good. We're the victims of action bias. It makes us feel good to say we're not using plastic straws anymore. And yeah, we shouldn't. but it's not solving the problem. The real solution has to be stopping the flows of trash from reaching the ocean through effective trash management. In the middle of it, a, a good stopgap solution may be the river intervention of plastic and trash. Can we stop it before it gets to the ocean, even though we're not managing the trash on land? Back in 1990, we did a strategic planning session for the San Diego Oceans Foundation. We brought a guy named Dr. Alexander Christakis out to talk to us. He says to fix a problem, you have to understand the whole problem. He called it blob theory. So you got these perceived problems, and then you got the whole blob, which is the real problem. So what's the whole problem? Well, we've already talked about what some of the smaller problems are, single-use plastics, cleanups. The whole problem is global trash management. And the way we're approaching the issue is by creating OMG moments. Oh my God, an ocean gyre twice the size of Texas. More plastic in the ocean by, than fish by 2050. Fish are full of microplastics, oh my God. Oh my God, does not solve the problem. These OMG impacts don't have owners. Anybody on an ocean gyre here? If you do, I'll talk to me afterwards. <laughs> we don't, nobody owns ocean gyres, nobody owns plastics and fish. Microplastics generally people don't own. We're all sad about whales and other animals killed by plastic, but nobody really owns that. But one OMG impact, does. It's plastic on global beaches. Each beach has an owner or people who care. They have common sources of trash, and those common sources are often unknown. You'll see in a minute. So we're approaching the crisis in a new way. We're trying to find the beaches trashed by plastic, link the trash to the source, and connect the people with common sources together to forge solutions, just like we did in San Diego when it was in a heavy period of construction. And the three pillars of our work are expressed that way. Provide global context to what looks like a local problem, the, patch, the, batch, the trash on your beach, unifying those global ocean communities, creating a social network, and then identifying the best practices that we know globally. And so the Plastics Be Gone initiative is where we're going with this. So one of that OMG moment, we use ArcGIS Line. Uh, when you look on a Google search like this one for trashed beaches, this is what you get. With ArcGIS Online, we can give each of those beaches context. We can say, here's the trash beaches in the world. Each red icon represents a trash beach. Clicking on the icon, just like the hope spots that Sylvia Earle talked about, gives you information and a picture about that beach. ArcGIS Online can show you what we call the red zone of plastic, the sources. I think we've all heard about 10 rivers contribute 90% of the trash to the ocean. You see them on the map. Five countries contribute 60% of the plastic. That's where the focus is. That's the highest priority if we're gonna solve the ocean problem now. And we're using GIS to see what others can't. And incidentally, these are the countries where, think about it, we're shipping our recycling to those countries. Goods are made competitively there that we don't feel like we can afford to manufacture here. They have lower labor costs to produce cheaper goods. Poor trash management's the rule and we're unwilling to address the real problem. So we're paying for cheaper goods and not addressing the plastic trash at home by trashing the ocean, unwittingly, unknowingly. ArcGIS Online, and this is on our map online, lets us see percent of inadequately managed waste. So with a pop-up in these countries, you see China, 74.3% of its plastic is inadequately managed. That's 23 million kilograms a day but that's where we're shipping our recycling until recently. So this is a really important map. It actually, had, part of this happened here last year at the same conference. We were aware that in Belize, and that's one of the red dots there in Central America, there was a trashed beach. And we became aware that the Niger River was one of the 10 rivers producing the most trash, plastics. And we looked at the ocean currents and we said, look, those currents go into the Caribbean. I wonder if all those beaches in the Caribbean 
are being trashed by the Niger River. Meanwhile, Guatemala and Honduras are squabbling over where the trash on their beach is coming from, each blaming the other. So we started to have a little different approach. We're gonna to put together a trash tracker it's based on ocean current data used by 1999, where you're gonna be able to put a dot on the ocean off of your trashed beach and see where that trash came from. This one goes the other way. But imagine if, if we drop that dot off of LA and you see where the track went in this prototype, that's not too far from Hawaii where one of the worst trash beaches of the world are. Imagine what the power would be if the people in Hawaii and the people in LA said, what the heck, our trash is fouling your beach. There'd be a lot, lot of power around that. We have other visualizations like this one from the Living Atlas. And other visualization will also be available. This is a really cool one. You should check this out. It's from Plastic Adrift by Imperial College in London. If you drop a little dot on the, where that duck is right there into the Niger River, you can see by time the, where all the plastic trash flows. You can see in that picture, we stopped it in the time frame that it goes to the Caribbean. So the analysis of ocean currents is only part of the detective work. We can get approximate ideas of where it came from, but to make sure we know where it came from, we're working with San Diego State University to create a multi-university and agency hackathon to see if we can come up with a tool set that will allow the stakeholders in each of those beaches to identify the likely source of their trash. Imagine the power of 30, 40 beaches in the Caribbean, tourism spots that depend on that tourism and they find out their trash is coming from the Niger River. I don't know if it does or not, but if it is, Imagine the power of those places and those countries to say, wait, this has to stop. We have to know the source of the crisis if we want to solve it. We're using Esri one, two, Survey 123 to play a key role in identifying beaches fouled by plastic and people working on the crisis. So you'll be able to put in your name, you can do it now. Put your beach on the coastal area there, pick your spot on the map, tell us what you think the primary source is, what's being done to solve the problem and other information, that, uh, and that goes to uh, um, two feature sets on our website. It's the same iteration of the same layer. One layer says, no, it hasn't been verified. The other says, yes. So the, one, the, the layer that says, yes, you've got the kind of the target like a, a, a bullseye. That's a verified beach, Camilo Beach in Hawaii in this case. The unverified might be uh, Laysan Island and Midway. They're verified now, but when I put this together, they weren't. So it's kind of a cool, cool implementation of Survey123 feature set. We're also using green rope, kind of another story to go back in history. When I was the head of the San Diego Ocean Foundation, a guy named Lars Helgeson was the science, uh, head of science for the San Diego County Office of Education. He was an advisor. Fast track forward to 2019, there's a company called Green Rope. It's full customer service uh, or customer relations management software. His name's Lars Helgeson. It's Lars Helgeson's junior. That's his son. He's a surfer. I meet him at a beach cafe when we need to talk about this, and he's helping us giving a full-service integrated software application that allows us to unify ArcGIS Online and Survey123 within it and manage all of our website, email, social media, et cetera. And we'll, we have an international social network and directory of ocean plastic experts and leaders. We want the folks in each of those beaches that are leading those charges to be able to talk with each other and the experts around the world that have solutions to the problems. Talking about best practices, our third pillar. So here's, we have multiple categories. These are just, we're, we're still getting out in the world to find out what the best one is, but some examples are, uh, here's best river interventions. I mentioned before in Goat Canyon and the Tijuana River, um, there's, this, there's a, a boom that stops all the trash from getting into the, into the valley and into the ocean. Uh, ocean Cleanup has just done a pretty cool thing with an ocean cleanup interceptor in rivers that maybe they want to deploy a thousand, in a thousand rivers by 2025, ambitious goal, but in my opinion, if we can stop them in the rivers, that's the best short uh, place we have to go. Um, and, and, I should, and I should also say that part of the challenge has been that all this information is random. I was talking to somebody earlier today up there and showing them, showing them some of this, and they said, I didn't know that. Now they know it, but they only know it because they talked to me. We shouldn't have to find out about stuff by just because we come to a great forum like this or we see a webinar or a story in the New York Times and, you know, and I tell Drew, hey, did you see that? We ought to have a place where we, for this problem and any other problem, specific ways to know what the problem is and what the solutions are. So our pillar, as I said, providing global context, taking local stuff and showing it how it fits in the world, unifying the folks that are involved with that and empowering them by ArcGIS Online and sharing globally the best practices available. 
we know that, that this is an intractable problem. It's really hard, and that the large-scale solutions are going to be are required. But um, one of my friends worked for the United Nations for years, and we talked about this, and I said, uh, you know, straws aren't the problem. And I talked about the Niger River. She said, you know, Carl, um, at least we're doing something. And the people in Niger, they can't afford to do this. If we don't think it can be fixed, we've given up. And we can't give up. You heard, you heard um, Sylvia Earle and Jack Dangerman talking about that yesterday. Where's the hope? We can't give up, but we have to identify the key problems, have a way to share them, and then do something about it. I really want to thank these organizations, Esri, as you can tell, for their great work and their partnership over the years. Green Rope uh, has been helpful. Ivari GIS is an Esri partner that helped us with the pop-up development and San Diego State University, which we're looking forward to developing that hackathon. I want to close with a couple of things. Charlie Moore, the Algalita Foundation is probably one of the leading organizations in trying to figure out what's happening with the gyres. You can read that there. All the king's horses and all the king's men will never gather up all the plastic and put the ocean back together again. Let's prove Charlie wrong. And here's how you can help. As part of the Global Esri Network, you also, you know about the environment. And you're spread all over the world. Help us fill out this first phase of trash beaches. If you know a beach that's trashed, go online to our website, fill out that survey one, two, three, and, and help us fill that out. There's some pretty smart brains in this room and elsewhere that can help us develop algorithms to better utilize current data so we can track that trash. Whoops, wrong way. Help spread the word through social networking. We're going to be doing a whole campaign from that in a couple of weeks. Share sources of funding to help fully integrate our plan if you've got ideas or donate. It's not a bad thing. And how do you think you can help? Go to www.openoceans.org. Whoops, wrong way because our website, new website, just went online, and you're the first to see it, and um, be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.